Paris in the fall, the last months of the year and the end of the millennium. The city holds many memories for me, of cafes, of music, of love, and of death. Hello everybody, it's me Peer coming at you one more time from the Game Throne. It's been a while, but let's not get into that. Today I want to talk to you about a very special game. This is a game I was going to leave right up until the second to last video that I was going to make in the Game Brover series. Stick around to the end to see why I've moved it up to now and to see what Revolution Software sent me and why I think they're so awesome. I hope you enjoyed the new intro. I taught myself Photoshop, animation and music creation just for that 14 second splash screen. Sure, it's no Disney animation, but I'm pleased with it. And I hope the new microphone that I've got is giving you a better listening experience too. So, if you're not familiar with my game Brover series, it's all about the games my younger brother and I used to play as kids and how those games brought us together. With my brother passing away in April 2021, aged only 33, this is the best tribute to him that I can come up with. Short reviews on the games that made us the brothers that we grew up to be, and I'll share a few memories and special moments along the journey. So, Broken Sword, what can I say? This is definitely one of the most influential games, not just in my brotherhood, but also personally. It taught me that I enjoyed point and click adventures and taught me to pay attention to my surroundings, but more on that later. Broken Sword, released in 1996 by Revolution Software, is a colourful tale of murder, investigation, history and mystery. The version that I am playing today is the Director's Cut re-release, which from what I can tell was released in 2020. There will be minor spoilers ahead, but I will try to keep them to a minimum. You follow our hero, George Stobart, an American who is holidaying in France when he unknowingly becomes witness to a murder, and Nico Collard, a French journalist who has been tracking the alleged murderer for some time. In the remastered version, there is also a new prologue section, along with a few mid-game parts too, where you play entirely new puzzles based around the journey Nico was taking at the same time that George was on his journey. Think Resident Evil 2, where both Claire and Leon's stories are happening simultaneously. Personally speaking, whilst I enjoyed playing the new sections, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the drastic differences in art style. Something that gave the original game its charm was the hand animation and the time, effort and love put into bringing those characters to life. In the new for 2010 sections, the animation has changed to a computer animation, and if I'm being totally honest, whilst the characters are for the most part true to style, they do look drastically different. Higher resolution, less animated than their 1996 counterparts, and they stand out. This can be quite jarring, especially during cutscenes where the new models have been mixed with the existing models. Take a look at the way the waitress is introduced in the 2010 version versus George's face in the 1996 version. I would much rather they had stayed true to form and animated the new parts in the same style as the original game. One more thing that isn't game breaking, but it is a bit of a change of pace, is the new style of puzzles. They're all stuff that's become a bit cliche, sliding block puzzles, ciphers and the like. It just feels like that it was added because they needed something to add for the director's cut, compared to the passion that was put into the original. The original puzzles were often surroundings based, although some of the new puzzles are a bit more in fitting with the classic game. Also, in the remake, you can hear quite a difference in some of the sound quality around the spoken dialogue. Now, I'm not sure if this was present in the original, but I don't recall it being there. Take a listen to this. The clown had fled into this alley. But there was no sign of him now. What a weird old man. You're just not going to believe what I found. It's not another part of the clown's costume, is it? As you can hear, there is an echo on some of the audio that's just not present on the original clips. One more problem with the remake is that if you have a high resolution screen, the subtitles and images in the game shrink massively, so I'd recommend temporarily changing the resolution of your screen whilst you play. There are more apt solutions, but this is the simplest. I know this sounds like I'm moaning, but let me assure you this is one of my favourite and beloved games of all time. It's almost as though I spend my days waiting to forget the story and solutions to the puzzles, just so I can find myself playing it all over again. 
Further, there are some great improvements in the director's cut, including, but not limited to, the game skipping long walking animations and being much easier to save and load and continue with your progress. Along the way, you'll meet many wonderfully animated, both in art and in personality, characters from all walks of life, far too many to list, and not one of them feels pushed into the story. They all have their place, their own traits, and are all memorable in their own way. I would go into all of my favourite characters, but that would spoil the fun for you and would be here all night. You should definitely play this game. However, a few notable mentions without giving things away would be the hotel clerk, the American tourists, the inspector's sidekick and the custodian. I have purposefully left their names out as getting to know these characters is all part of the fun. The writing in the game is absolutely phenomenal and some of the characters had my brother and I absolutely laughing our butts off. Please, hold it right there. Oh, don't shoot. I'm innocent. I'm an American. Can't make up your mind, huh? I demand... The gameplay, like many point-and-click adventures, involves you wandering around showing everyone you can the contents of your pockets, be they disgusting, stolen, useful, or completely irrelevant. When investigating, whilst the game does suffer from the I don't think so solution to trying things that don't work, generally speaking... George has something unique to say about each item or object in the world that you can interact with. Also, rather wonderfully, a lot of the items have unique animations, such as attempting to lift a sewer lid with your bare hands, or rocking valuable artefacts in the museum, much to the dismay of the custodian who's trying to do his day job. This might be something you take for granted these days, but don't forget, as far as I can tell, this is all animated. It's not scripted models moving in set ways. What the game does really well is the way in which you talk to the inhabitants of the world. You get a feel for who they are as a person, and further, George's respect level for them. George never been one to shy away from a witty remark or a snarky quip when the mood takes him. It's George's charisma that tends to not only get him in trouble, but also, using his wit and charm, allows him to solve puzzles in the world that directly involve its inhabitants, as well as the usual entourage of inanimate objects. As you progress through the game, you'll be whisked away to many absolutely gorgeous, or should I say, gorgeous, locations all around the world. It's all beautifully drawn, and each with an atmosphere that really represents the new location that you're in. Again, I won't spoil too many of these things, as it's a huge part of getting the full experience from the game, that feeling of being the lost and lonely outlander in a new community. This is all backed up by an absolutely stunning soundtrack that helps give you a real feel of mystery and intrigue. It's rewarding when you progress, dark when you're in danger, and complements the environment wonderfully. There is one puzzle that I absolutely have to mention or the comments section will tear me a new one, which is the infamous goat puzzle. Many people got stuck here for a long time. And don't forget, this was in the time before guides on the internet were so freely available. Getting stuck meant calling a hotline or hoping your friend whose mom bought him all of the walkthroughs would know the answer when you met him in school the next day. This is a wonderful segue into why this game means so much to the memory of my dear departed brother. Aside from this drawing I did for him a few Christmases ago and our constant mimicking of the cursor hand whenever we pointed anywhere, my brother and I had this game, and still do, on a compilation disc known as the Help Charity Compilation. It contained this, Mist, Road Rash, which barely worked I might add, and I still own that compilation to this day. Scott and I had spent many nights trying to figure out how to escape this screen. We completed the start of this game hundreds of times, just trying to figure out what to do. We ended up stuck in a loop, walking from screen to screen, going over the same dialogue again and again, and this went on for what felt like years. One night I had volunteered at my school to do an open night for the parents of the potential new students the next year. My dad was driving me to said open night and suddenly my phone rang. This was the first mobile phone I'd ever had, a Siemens S8 for those of you who are old enough to remember. And the person calling was my brother. Now, back in those days, we didn't have three minutes, so I knew this call was important. I can't remember if my brother had a mobile, which if he did, it meant his call was expensive. 
Or, if not, he must have asked my mom's permission to call a mobile from a landline and for her to actually say yes. I can't imagine how much importance Scott would have stressed about the need to call. So there I am, being driven away from home and ready for a few hours of talking to parents about why their kids should attend my crappy school. The phone rings, I answer, and I get Scott shouting wildly down the phone. Smeep! Smeep, I figured it out! I figured it out, you pick up the newspaper! What? Unbroken sword, the newspaper. You pick up the newspaper and then you can talk to the builder and then you can get in the sewer. What? No. I've got these stupid parents open night. No, I want to come home. But alas, my dad wouldn't let me come home and said I had to keep my promise to the school. I remember how slow that night was, but eventually I got home and Scott showed me what he was on about. My mind was not only blown, but I felt myself fall in love with solving puzzles. Scott and I had completed the game together over the course of the next few afternoons, working together to help each other figure out what to do. And that's how this game brought Scott and I together, and how I developed my love for point and clicks, good humour, and the Knights Templar. But Smeep, you said at the start Revolution Software did something awesome for you. Well remembered, good friend. Indeed, there is a heartwarming story behind this. Very minor spoilers ahead. So, a few months ago, sometime in September 2021, I was up late watching YouTube videos when I stumbled across a video of this game, a section in a hotel called the Hotel Ubu. In the hotel lobby is a lady, quite literally a lady, known as Lady Piermont. She's a British lady in every classic way. Stiff upper lip, dry sense of humour, and takes no crap. And of course, she's from Hemel Hempstead to boot. I could honestly just play the dialogue from her and George's conversation and it'd have you in bits, but I digress. The video I found was simply a clip of her playing the piano, a very short original piece, a somber quiet melody that she's just idly playing to whoever happens to be listening. It brought me to tears. In the months since my brother's passing, this simple, beautiful melody with its missed keys and all brought me the closest to my brother I'd felt since his untimely passing. I'm tearing up just writing this script. So in the light of what this song had done for me in this moment of bittersweet sadness, I wrote a short email to Revolution Software thanking them for what they'd done with this piece of music. For the first time, I felt less distant from my brother, who I miss so very much. To my surprise, just two days later, I got an email from a lovely lady at Revolution Software named Wendy who asked me for my address. I complied, but I said that they didn't need to do anything for me. The song had done enough, along with all the memories that the game itself had given to us in our childhood. A few weeks later in the post, I received this comic, signed by none other than Charles Cecil. Who is that, you ask? Only the designer of Broken Sword. It's thanks to him and his team that I got to have these wonderful memories that I'm so privileged to share with you today. I wrote back to Revolution Software to say thank you, but not just that. I asked for permission to use their song in this video. That's right, I asked a video game company if I could use their copyrighted material. And so, take a moment to reflect on those loved and lost as I present to you with a heartfelt thanks to Revolution Software and their wonderful team, in full, uninterrupted, Lady Piermont's Ubu Atmosphere.